everyone. My name is Andrew, and this is the fourth session, the fourth weekend of my crash course for the Florida bar exam. And today we're going to discuss real property, which I believe is the most difficult subject on the exam for essays, because there's so many different areas of real property that they could test. We just spent the first hour and a half with the class, making sure everyone felt good and was in a good space and had good study habits. And then we also did a Jeopardy review where we went and included um, contracts towards federal con law, Florida con law, and real property. And we did a great job as a class. And then I went over individually every subject and just kind of talked about my approaches and what some of the staples were. And just to reiterate very quickly what some of those staples were, you know, contract law, just making sure you have the backbone outline from you know, offer acceptance, consideration, the whole formation, the valid defenses, the damages, the breach, and then I'm sorry, the breach and then the damages, and then consider some of the more heavily tested issues in Florida, such as non-competes and anticipatory repudiation. With torts, throw the kitchen sink of torts at them and always remember the staples. Florida is a pure comparative negligence state. Florida has abolished joint and several liability and punitive damages are three times compensatory or $500,000, whichever is greater. And then we talked about con law. The staples are for Florida con law, make sure you know about the homestead exemption and the sunshine law, and be suspicious that whatever they tell you is gonna be vague and overbroad. And then there's a bunch of Florida details we can talk about, but those are the staples, homestead exemption and sunshine law. And then from a federal lens, it's usually first amendment, due process, equal protection. Those are some of the big things that you're going to see. Now that brings us into real property, which is more difficult than the other sections because it's tough to tell you what the staples are per se. You know, I could say landlord tenant, I could say mortgages, I could say adverse possession, but you'll see at some point, I'm just going to keep saying things. It's kind of like torts, but the difference is on a torts essay, it's usually related. There's a lot of torts that come together in a particular claim. In a real property essay, it's 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 uh, more diverse. You know, if it's a landlord tenant issue, then it's not going to have anything to do with you know real covenants or um, deed formalities, right? They're just unrelated aspects of real property that you have to know each and individually. So the first part of today's lecture is going to be pretty short and. Uh, and then we'll do you know, more details in the, in the second part of the lecture, but I'm gonna begin by sharing my screen and uh, just going over a PowerPoint that I had created in the past that I actually really like, and I think there wasn't a need to do too much more with it because it was solid. Real property is hard to teach, and I just wanna have different, um, different ways of giving you all exposure. And again, with everything that I do, totally open floor ask me questions let's dig into the details and, and make sure we understand real property so what day is it today it's today squeak piglet my favorite day said boo i think that's huge uh philosophy about life just be in the moment right today is a good day today is a great day to learn if we just stay focused right now i'm telling you all, i'm gonna teach you all real property in a short amount of time and if you can bear with me then um it'll be a very valuable use of your time so here's some of the uh, subjects that I identified or tested, deeds and titles, estates and property interests, joint tenancies, covenants and equitable servitudes, landlords and tenants, easements, adverse possession, homestead exemption, miscellaneous, and then some essay writing. Somewhere in here, we'll definitely have a mortgage conversation too. Um, okay, so... I don't think anything's changed since, when was this? 2001, 21? Still the same, still got two dogs. You can faintly hear Rosie barking downstairs. Over prepare, over perform. Our new slogan is revolutionizing education one student at a time. Um, all right, let's talk about deeds and titles. So deeds versus titles, what's the difference? The difference is that a deed is a legal document whereas a title describes a legal position of ownership, right? You can have title by deed. In fact, that's the best way to have title is by deed. But you could also have title by adverse possession. 
There could also be a circumstance where a lot of people think they have title. So what would they have? They would have color of title. Color of title is the appearance of title, whereas actual title means you really have it. Um, actual title is a traditional legal title. So if there's a lot of people who think they have title to a property, what we'd have is an action to quiet title. And that's a good vocabulary word to use. An action to quiet title is a lawsuit designed to clear title to land and remove any clouds on title. So that's the first thing, you know, understand how has this property been granted to the person? Was it by deed? Do they have legal title? And if it was granted by deed, did it conform with deed formalities? So in order for a deed to be valid under Florida law, it must be attested by two witnesses and contain an accurate description of the land and be properly delivered. In Florida, for a deed to be properly delivered, physical delivery is not required. So one thing to look out for is if you deliver a deed, but retain the power to take it back, that's not delivery. If I say, here, my lawyer, give this to Johnny, but if I call you in a week and tell you to give it back, then give it back to me. That's not gonna be proper delivery. But if you give it to someone with the intent that it's been delivered, then that person indeed has delivered the deed. And again, it has to be attested by two witnesses and contain an accurate description of the land and be properly delivered. Um, what else can I think of with, with uh, deeds? Um, you could have a stopple by deed. Does anyone out there know that, that uh, concept? A stopple by deed? It refers to a situation where let's say um, I give my brother, well, let's say this. I have a piece of land that I have title to and my brother creates an instrument that purports to give title to um, his girlfriend, right? So it's not his, it's mine, but he grants title to his girlfriend. And then I give my brother the property. I convey it to him. Well, a stop by deed will mean that my brother's prior conveyance to his girlfriend in which he didn't have the authority to convey at the time will be valid once my brother receives the um, authority to transfer. So it'll validate his previous transfer to his girlfriend. So under that scenario where my brother makes a conveyance to his girlfriend and then acquires title to property, it will reactivate the prior conveyance. That's what a stop by deed means. But usually it's just going to be very simple. Like Tommy signs his deed over. When you see an essay with deed formalities, you kind of want to, or they mention a deed, you kind of want to say, it's assumed that this deed complied with deed formalities. In order for a deed to be valid under Florida law, it must be tested by two witnesses and contain an accurate description of land and properly and be properly delivered. Um, very important. This is a staple. There's two staples, I would say. I said there weren't staples, but there's pretty much two staples of Florida property essays. One is that Florida is a pure notice recording statute. And the other I'll get to later is that Florida is a lien theory state. But for right now, I'll talk about what a pure notice recording statute means. Under this type of recordings act, a subsequent bona fide purchaser without notice prevails. The order of the recording after the subsequent purchaser is irrelevant. So you're gonna look in the fact pattern of two different people are claiming title to a property, but one person recorded, right? If that person recorded and they paid for the land and they had no notice that anyone else had an interest in the property and it was in good faith, then they will prevail. It will be their property because they're a bona fide purchaser. But you got to be careful with notice. Does anyone know any different types of notice? Yeah, there's uh, actual notice and constructive notice, which makes up which is made up of inquiry and record notice. Exactly. There's actual notice, like you literally knew about it, or there's constructive notice. I mean, you should have known about it. And constructive notice can be either through inquiry notice, like, come on, bro, you should have walked down the property and did a little inquiry, or record notice. Like it's literally in the, um, it's literally in the records. It's recorded. Yeah, it's recorded. So does everyone understand that? What a bona fide purchaser means and what a pure notice jurisdiction like Florida means. I want to stop there and, and make sure everyone gets that because it kind of be confusing if you don't understand that. That's like a clear and concise. It's like me telling you that like two plus two is four to everyone. 
we'll go over some essays this afternoon and it's not going to be as easy as it sounds. I promise you that. But like, if everyone is shaking their head, like, okay, duh, Florida's pure recording note, pure notice recording statute, bona fide purchasers will prevail. I'm cool if you're all cool, but feel free to stop me. That's what I'm here for. All right. Marketable title. An interest in land is not enforceable if it has not been recorded or refiled within 30 years. So you have a duty to deliver marketable title, right? If someone uh, has a conveyance and there's an encumbrance on the property, there's, you know, an easement or a mortgage or threat of litigation on the property, then that is not marketable title. I mean, you can con contract out of marketable title and say like, I know there's an encumbrance on it. It's okay. Like that's one thing. But if you just have like, you know, a, a general warranty deed, let's say, then you definitely have a duty to deliver marketable title. Um, I wrote this word tax deed because this showed up on my essay in February 2017. So always want to be prepared. In Florida, a parcel of real property becomes eligible for a tax deed sale when ad valorem taxes become more than two years past due, right? So make sure you pay your taxes on the property. You can get a tax deed, you can get a tax credit, pay that tax credit, and then get a tax deed, which means that you have paid off the taxes and you own that property. So if they say that in the question, like Johnny applies for a tax credit and gets it and then gets a tax deed, it's, that's just that concept. So deeds and titles, we understand deed versus title. Deed is the document. Make sure from this slide, you understand deed formalities, two witnesses, and pure notice is gonna protect the bona fide purchaser. Types of deeds, general warranty deed, special warranty deed, and quit claim deed. General warranty deed is what you want when you buy a property. It's the most common deed used in the sale of residential properties. This deed does more than convey a few simple title to the property from sale to buyer. It also provides certain covenants of title. So general warranty deed warrants the chain of title, where special warranty deed just warrants during the person who owned it. And we have a general warranty deed. There's going to be the present and future warranties, right? The present warranties are the covenant of size in the seller. In fact, owns the property being conveyed as a sole owner and the only party in possession, the covenant, of the right to convey the seller has the right to convey the property. The seller asserts that there are no undisclosed or non-visible encumbrances against the party being conveyed. These are the present warranties. Once the property has been transferred and everything's good, you can't sue on that later. You can only sue on that at the time of the deed delivery. The future warranties are going to be the covenant of quiet enjoyment, covenant of general warranty, and then further assurances. Um, the covenant of quiet enjoyment, the seller states that the buyer's use, possession, during the property will not be disturbed or disquieted because of a defect in the title of the property. The covenant of a general warranty, the seller will protect the buyer from harm caused by title defects and defend the buyer from any claims by others of the property's title. So if you can memorize, memorize the size and right to convey, encumbrances, quiet enjoyment, general warranties, those are uh, things that come with a general warranty deed. Then there's a special warranty deed, which is only against anything that occurred in their physical ownership. In other words, the grantor doesn't guarantee anything and defects in clear title that existed before they took possession of the property. And then the quick claim deed is like a deed that contains no warranties at all. You would see this in like a shotgun sale or something like that. Um, they don't really talk about estates and fee simples. I mean, for those who are taking the MBE, sure, you definitely need to know this. Fee simple is when you um, transfer everything, even in the lack of the words A to his heirs, a fee simple is assumed in Florida unless there are words to the contrary. A fee simple creates a permanent absolute interest in land term at will. To A to B, B has a fee simple. A to B and his heirs, B has a fee simple, right? Um, life estate permits an owner to have full use of their property for the duration of their life, but a life estate is just like a regular tenant where they can't uh, commit waste and that waste could be ameliorative, it could be permissive, or it could be actual. Does anyone know if you have a life estate and there's a remainder man, who pays the taxes on the property and who uh, pays the mortgage? Like who pays the principal of the mortgage and who pays the interest and who pays the taxes? I don't want to say the wrong answer. Does anyone know the right answer? You have a remainder man and a life tenant. And the question is the mortgage, which has principal and interest and the taxes.
Anyone know? Especially if you're taking the MB. Repeat the question. Okay. If you have a life tenant and a remainder man, who is responsible for the taxes on the property? And then who's responsible for the mortgage? And the mortgage will be principal and interest. Wouldn't it be both? For both of them? The life estate tenant is responsible for both what? The taxes and the mortgage. And the principal. And then the remainder man will pay the interest on the um, mortgage payments. Okay, cool. That's more of an MBE thing, but just sharpening iron sharpens iron here. Okay, Shelly rule. Again, these couple things I'm not super worried about. Florida has abolished the Shelly rule, meaning if a conveyance is made to A for life, remainder to A's heirs, then A receives a life estate with remainder per stirpes and A's lineal descendants in being at the time the life estate commences. So A for life, remainder to A heirs. I mean, that's like the same thing as just saying A to life, right? Because the remainder to A's heirs is what would already be, uh, you know, per stirpes um, via will. There's no need to say remainder to A's heirs. They, that would be the same uh, conveyance. And then doctrine of order your title, the doctrine of order your title has been abolished, meaning conveyance to A for life, remainder to the heirs of O is valid and does not create a reversion in O, right? To A for life, remainder to the heirs of O is valid and does not create a reversion in O. Um, because this would say if O is still alive, then would it go to O or would it go to O's heirs? And here they're saying it's valid that it can go to O's heirs. Again, don't worry about these Shelley rule doctrine worthy of title. This rule against perpetuities, I could see coming up in an essay as a minute issue, but just remember it. No interest is valid unless it must pass at all, no later than 21 years after some life and being at the creation of the interest. In Florida, a gift is valid if it either satisfies the common law rule or if it actually vests or fails within 90 years of its creation. That's just like a brownie point you can get on top. You know, if you see a, a conveyance and you see it might have a rule against perpetuities issue, they have talked about in some essays, you know, just say, would this violate a rule against perpetuities? Um, anyone have any questions about rule against perpetuities? Do we know what it means? Oh, I renamed something. So everyone knows the um, fertile octogenarian, right? Does everyone know that that case, the fertile octogenarian? Do they teach anything in law school these days? You don't even know that. that that's to anyone else that ever heard of that, the fertile octogenarian? I think I might know what it is. It sounds familiar. We talked about it, Mark, but anyone else? Yeah, we talked about it. The fertile octogenarian, is that a common case that you guys studied against rule, for rule against perpetuities? For, for those taking the MBE, it's, it's very important. No one's heard of this, the fertile octogenarian? Outside of you, I heard it in law school, but that was it, I think, like once. Interesting. Well, I changed it to be called the sexy grandma because I think that's easier for people to memorize. But the fertile octogenarian is the classic case of how they explain the rule against perpetuities. And the reason why I realize it needs to be called the sexy grandma is because people don't even know what an octogenarian means. Some people think it's a octopus. What did you think it was, Mark? I would have thought it was some sort of octopus. I thought she had like eight kids. If she had octogenarian, octa, I don't know. Well, that's what you thought. Eight kids. Someone with eight kids. Yeah. yeah. See, Joel thought it was a, a doctor. A Mark thought it was um, a person with eight kids. And I thought it was an octopus. But really, it's a sexy grandma. So real quickly, I know this is an aside, but for those taking the MBE, it's important. Rule against perpetuities means this. And this is the best way to explain it. If... Sexy grandma is 80 years old and she has a 30 year old kid and she says a 31 year old kid and she says, I make I give this house to any of my kids who reach the age of 30 when I die. Right. So um, when I die, I give this gift to any of my kids who reach the age of 30. Now, she only has one kid who's 31 years old. So it seems like, OK, the, the house is going to the kid. We've got to remember the sexy grandma, the fertile octogenarian. It could very well be the measuring life, which is the kid, dies at 31, right? Then the very next year, sexy grandma has a baby, right? She's fertile. Now that baby's born. Then grandma dies. Now it would take 30 years for that kid to reach the age of 30 for him to get the property or not. He might not reach the age of 30. He could not make it. 
So it's not sure whether it'll vest or not. It could be 29 years later and then he dies and it never vested. That would violate the rule against perpetuities. So just to, just, you know, real property is tough. We're digging deep. That's the best way of understanding the rule against perpetuities is sexy grandma. Is it possible that there's going to be a measuring life and it's possible that more than 21 years after the death of that measuring life, the interest won't vest. All right. And then statute of frauds, make sure you know this. This comes back to contracts. In Florida, a writing is required for the sale of land, right? It needs to also describe the land, have um, the parties, the accurate description of the land and the parties, the grantor and the grantee. I did an MBE question recently that it wasn't sufficient because it said like, I grant this land to all the um, churches in the county. Like, I don't know, it's just something insufficient. It needs to be like to Thomas or something of that nature. So, so far we just talked about deeds, deeds and titles, estates and property interests. Not so much what you're like, the heart of a Florida essay, but just to get your mind set on real property. This definitely you wanna see, joint tenancies. JTROS, tens in common, tens by entirety. A tenancy by entirety is literally a JTROS plus marriage, right? JTROS, remember there has to be four unities, T-tip, time, title, interest and possession. This means that the parties taking interest in the property must take the interest at the same time by the same title with the same interest in the property and have equal possession to the property. Additionally, specific language must be found in the deed in order to create a joint tenancy, such as with rights of survivorship. Without that specific language, Florida law assumes the creation of a tenancy in common. Tenancy in common, when one tenant passes away, her descendants' heirs inherit the property rights according to the will. It's the default ownership in Florida. So remember, me and Mark are tenants in common. If something happens to me, then um, my heirs will take my half. Me and Mark are tenants by the tenants, uh, joint tenants right of survivorship. If something happens to me, Mark will survive me and take my half. Me and Mark are joint tenants with um, tenants by the entirety. We're joint tenants right of survivorship. We also have been duly wed. Um, okay, covenants and equitable servitudes. Equitable servitudes differ from covenants. The key to this is how. Think about the word equitable. Equitable servitudes are remedied by injunctive relief. Without getting too deep into this, um, injunctive relief is uh, um, equitable by like, I mean, equitable servitudes is remedied by injunctive relief. So I have a, a rule in my neighborhood that we all have to have blue doors, right? And if I painted my door red, what would the punishment be? I have to paint it back blue. That would most likely be an equitable servitude. If there's some sort of monetary relief involved, then um, it would be a uh, covenant. Now, again, not too heavily tested, right? We want to talk about, does it run with the land? Does it touch a concern of the land? Is there horizontal and vertical privity? I've seen this in maybe one essay, right? Um, talking about whether the burden or the benefit runs with the land. Uh, we'll look into this in the specific essay. It can get a little bit difficult. Just know that usually these covenants and equitable servitudes are gonna run with the land if they were intended to, if they have notice, if they touch and concern the land and there was privity between the original owners or it was like a common scheme or plat. It usually runs with the land, but if there was no horizontal vertical privity, then there might be some arguments, but I don't want everyone to get lost in the sauce. I would much rather people just say, do I know what joint tenancy is? Do I know the difference between JTROS and tenants in common? Okay. Do I know what a covenant and equitable servitude will look like? It'll look like, uh, you know, all the houses must be blue or anyone who plants a maple tree has to cut it down and pay fees or anyone who has, you know, something like that. So we have covenants, real servitudes, joint tenancies, deeds, title, pure notice statute. These are like, you know, we're starting to understand, okay, a lot of things are tested on real property. I want to make sure that I have a general idea about them all. This section could be literally an entire essay, right? That's truth of the matter. Landlords and tenants. We try to want to remember some of these things. So a lease for a term greater from one year, a writing is required and must be signed by the lessor in the presence of two subscribing witnesses. Um, a non-residential tenancy at will, termination notice is not less than three months for year to year, not less than 45 days from quarter to quarter, and not less than 15 days from month to month, 
not less than seven days for week to week. So this is non-residential. This is like commercial. And it's um, three months for year to year, 45 days, quarter to quarter, 15 days, month to month, seven days, week to week. For residential, termination is 60 days for year to year, not less than 30 days for quarter to quarter, 15 days for month to month, and seven days for week to week. So month to month and week to week are always 15 days. Quarter to quarter is 30 days residential, 40 non-residential. And then um, year to year is 45 days for non-residential, 60 days for uh, residential. So you have more time for yearly notice and quarterly notice if it's residential. That's so, the put. So for, for these two, uh, whether residential or not residential, does this apply to termination by either the landlord or the tenant? If the tenant chooses not to renew or the landlord chooses likewise not to renew? Yeah, sure. It's more, I mean, the way it'll be tested is the landlord, right? right? But yeah, if you're going to, I mean, because think about it. If you, you could also just terminate by just not renewing it. This is like the option to renew. So in all intents and purposes, this is a landlord rule of imposition. Um, we talk about what type of tendencies there are. Do I talk about that here? Not, maybe not on this slide, but um, what are there? There's tenancy um, for years, which was in the Jeopardy questions. And tenancy for years just means for a specific time. There's um, a periodic tenancy, which are these um, type of things like, you know, month to month or week to week or something that's just kind of repeated. Um, there's tenancy at will. So, I mean, actually, these these are tenancies at will, right? Um, I guess a periodic tenancy is a, a tenancy at will. There's tenancy at sufferance, which means that like you're a holdover tenant. Any other type of tenancies? Periodic tenancy, um, tenancy for years, tenancy at will, tenancy at sufferance, which is like a holdover tenant. Those are different types of tenancies. Definitely one of the lesser duties and the least lessee duties. The lessor must deliver possession of the premises. So that's in Florida. Not every state has to deliver possession. Um, someone talks to me, your period will suffer. I like that. It's a, it seems like it's an acronym for. Yeah, I get it. Tenancy for years, periodic tenancy, tenancy at will, and tenancy at sufferance. And I think that I can't attest to it personally, but I think that definitely resonates with truth for a lot of people. Um, okay, lesser duties. The lesser must deliver possession of premises or allow lessee quiet enjoyment of the premises and maintain the premises as habitable. Further, they have the duties of extermination, locks and keys, clean and safe common areas, garbage removal, running water, hot water, and for structural repairs. These duties may be altered or modified in writing. The lessee duties, the lessee has the duty to pay rent and not commit waste. Additionally, the lessee must comply with the health code, keep the premises clean, keep plumbing in good repair, remove garbage, use plumbing and electrical equipment carefully, refrain from disturbing neighbors and not destroy the premises. Different types of waste, permissive waste, letting things rot, actual or affirmative waste is causing waste and ameliorative waste, beneficial but still waste. So again, I'm really big on like, what are key word terms that they test on the Florida bar? Definitely the waste doctrines, definitely ameliorative, actual permissive waste. That's key to be able to write about. Definitely joint tenancies, joint tenants with the right of survivorship. Definitely um, types of deeds, right? General warranty, special warranty, quick claim deed. Definitely deed formalities, pure notice statutes. These are things that, you know, just kind of going through the outline are some of the important ones to have down strongly. Um, abandonment. Abandonment occurs when lessee is absent for 30 days, coupled with non-payment of rent. If lessor obtains rid of possession, she may repossess and give up right to collect rent wait and sue for unpaid rent or re-enter the premises on behalf of lessee and holding lessee liable for any loss. Um, self-help, Florida does not permit self-help removing a breaching lessor in a landlord-tenant relationship. So we'll go over one of these this afternoon, a landlord-tenant essay. It's basically just gonna be like nightmare tenant, nightmare landlord, breach of habitability. Um, they have, there's been a constructive eviction because you know, no one could actually live there. So, you know, what's the what's the procedure for a constructive eviction is like to provide notice and then move out. Um, things like that. Uh, okay, 
easements. So definitely easements and adverse possessions are things in Florida that we definitely need to know. Um, easements, uh, express easement, implied easement, uh, statutory easement by way of necessity, prescriptive easement, a pertinent easement, easement in gross and negative easement. These are all different types of easements. I know Joel, you're the type of person who, and excuse me, I'm gonna walk outside with my dog, but you like to write a lot about uh, everything. And you don't know when you should and when you shouldn't. I would when it comes to easements. If I see an easement, I would give the reader all the different types of easements, right? I just feel like it's, that's an area you could dump. You could say these are the different types of easements and uh, these are the ones I'll talk about. So express easement created when parties agreed to allow a dominant estate, a specific use on a serving estate. A person using an express easement beyond the stated use is liable for a surcharge for the value of the overuse. That's a word that I like, a surcharge, right? A surcharge means that, okay, you had a use, but you did too much on it. We all understand what an easement is, right? An easement is a right to cross over or to use someone else's property. And the best way to get an easement is expressed when it's actually written and you have that, uh, that knowledge. Um, this word right here, easement of pertinent, I know everyone loves the professor who sings the song about it takes two, right? Because you have a dominant and serving estate as opposed to an easement in gross where that just benefits one party. Easement and grosses are usually like a utility pole or the FPL, the Florida Power and Light. Everyone good with um, easement of pertinent, which is the dominant and serving estate, two parties. Easement and gross, which is personal in nature. It's not going to run with the land. An easement of pertinent will run with the land. Now, an easement can be created expressly in writing, or it could be implied. If there's initial unity of ownership, severance of that unity, and requisite disease, um, degree of necessity. Uh, you could have an easement by way of necessity, and usually it's to access a public road when you're so hemmed in that you don't have access to a public road. Um, so the claimant must show that the parcel is located outside a municipality, that she uses her parcel for agricultural purposes, and that the land is so hemmed in that there's no reasonable route of entry or exit without the easement. In Florida, there's no need to prove unity of title from a common source. Now, I know it says they must show the parcel is located outside a municipality. I try to help students with like Florida, like I, I'm sure one of the commercial providers gave us or someone gave us that definition, which is the correct definition. But even on a test, if you see a situation where they don't say they're outside a municipality, but they say that they don't have access to a public road, I would still definitely write that they probably have a claim for easement by necessity. Like don't get thrown off by like some of the, uh, almost archaic language of the of the definitions. We know express easement is in writing, implied easement is not in writing, easement by way of necessity is to access a public road, easement of pertinent is two parties, dominant and servient, easement in gross is personal in nature, like a, a utility pole or something, and then prescriptive easement, that's heavily tested. Why is it heavily tested? Because it's just like adverse possession. Same as adverse possession, just no need for exclusivity. Why is that? Well, because adverse possession, you're acquiring title to land. Easement by prescription, you're just acquiring use over land, but multiple people can have the same use. So there's no need to prove that you're the exclusive one using it. Whereas adverse possession, yeah, you need to show that you're the exclusive one that has title to it. So look for that difference between adverse possession and statute of limitations. And Mark, when I put seven years, you got it with adverse possession. If I would have put 20 years, you would have got it for um, prescriptive easement. And then negative easement, Florida recognized negative easement, a view for riparian rights, but not for light air and lateral subjacent support. So Florida actually is the hallmark case on this, the Fountain Blue versus Eden Rock case. There's no right to a shadow or sunshine or anything like that, but there is a right to water rights, to reasonable use, natural flow. You know, we will recognize riparian rights. Make sure you know what that word means, right? Parian rights, it's water rights. Um, adverse possession, I like this hostile ocean, open, continuous, exclusive, actual, notorious. Um, you could just talk about in Florida, there's two ways to claim with color of title and without color of title. Just know that without color of title, you have to pay the taxes. 
Um, with color of title, usually you just, I don't know, have to, have to put a fence over it, right? Color of title means appearance of title. So, you know, you, it appears that you have title. It's, it's in the records of some sort that you have title. If, you, if there's no way to know that you had title, then you're going to have to actually pay the taxes and have improved it or substantial enclosure on it. So I actually had that confused. Without color of title is when you have to put a fence around it. Um, with color of title means you just have to have used it or improved it for some way. Again, kind of confusing, Florida specific things. Just be confident that when you get an adverse possession claim, it's gonna be a squatter's right. Someone who's just squatted on a property for over seven years and has you know acquired rights to it. Don't get caught up in the color of title without color of title and how they pay taxes. I'm just giving you the, the actual language. So we see there's easements, adverse possession, two very heavily tested things that come up on the exam. Um, statute of limitations of real property in Florida, seven years. Um, a statute of limitation of permanent property is four years. So that'd be like your cars or something like that. Homestead exemption, we talked about a million times in, uh, in our lives, right? There should be exempt from for sale under the process of any court and no judgment, decree, or execution shall be lien thereon, except for payment of taxes and the assessments thereon, obligations contracted for the purchase, improvement, or repair thereof, or obligations contracted for house, field, or other labor performed on the realtor. The following property owned by a natural person, a homestead, if located outside a municipality to the extent of 160 acres of contiguous land improvements thereon, which shall not be reduced without the owner's consent by reason of subsequent inclusion in municipality, or if we locate within a municipality to the extent of one half acre of contiguous land upon which the exemption shall be limited to the residence of the owner or the owner's family. So that's the actual language from the homestead exemption. We all know protects a half an acre inside a municipality, a hundred contiguous acres outside a municipality from these creditors. There's certain creditors that can pierce it, um, taxes or, uh, mortgages or uh, liens on the actual property. And now that we say liens on the actual property, that takes us to one of the most important staples of Florida real property essays, right? Florida is a lien theory state. A joint tenancy with rights of survivorship allows either party to encumber their interest in the land as they wish. This means that either party may take out a mortgage and use their interest in the land as collateral or may allow creditors to place a lien on the property. However, such an encumbrance does not alter the other property's interest in the JTROS. Additionally, in lien theory states, because an encumbrance placed on the land by one member of the JTROS does not hinder the other holder's interest, if the encumbered holder dies before paying back the mortgage or the lien, the creditor cannot collect from the unencumbered holder. In summary, since Florida is a lien theory state, a mortgage on the property is not severed joint tenancy right of survivorship. When I took my test February 2017, I recognize this issue. I was like, there was Doug and there was Tom and we'll, we'll do this essay today. And like Doug, you know, uh, took a lien out or mortgage, like took a mortgage out on the property or took a loan out on the property. And I recognized that that would not sever the JTROS because Florida is a lien theory state. And that was one of those moments where I'm like, yes, I recognize some Florida specific thing and that's good. So lien theory state, Florida is pure notice jurisdiction and Florida's a lien theory state. We'll, we'll circle back to this in, you know, um, later this morning, but does anyone have any questions about Florida being a lien theory state as opposed to a title theory state? I know um, Sabrina in California, that's a title theory state. So if you have any questions, you know, feel free to ask me. Um, All right, sounds good, thank you. All right. Risk of loss. So Florida follows a majority rule, which places the risk of loss on the purchaser on the execution of a binding contract for the sale of land. Can someone not named Joel tell me what that theory is known as? The risk of loss passing at the contract. Equitable conversion. Equitable conversion. See that Jeopardy game did help. So that's equitable conversion. Eminent domain we talked about is the takings. There must be full compensation for its highest and best use. Private property taken after 2007 may not be conveyed to a natural person or private entity without the passing vote from three fifths of each house of legislator. Um, just compensation, just compensation. No, that's the word you need for eminent domain. We talked about this already in con law. You see a lot of the things overlap. Homestead exemption, eminent domain, nuisance. These are nuisance can be a tort. Eminent domain can be con law. Homestead exemption can be con law, but it's all real property too, right? 
So any building or place which tends to annoy the community or injure the health of the community, the attorney general or other qualified actor may sue in the name of the state if the nuisance reasonably annoys the community. I told you when we did torch, we talked about private nuisance. I was like, at some point, we're going to talk about a public nuisance. It usually comes at someone's building as a public nuisance. And then nuisance abatement, abatement or elimination of a public nuisance is not a valid public purpose for which eminent domain may be properly exercised. Um, all right. And then, you know, I just, yeah, this is my essay from February 2017. This is the essay from 2019. There's, and this is the essay from February 2012. Um, we're going to go over multiple, multiple essays this uh, afternoon. One thing that we didn't really talk about, which we're going to touch on when we come back from break, is mortgages and how mortgages operate. I think that's pretty heavily tested. Um, overall, though, with this PowerPoint that we went through, deeds and titles, right? The difference between a deed and a title. A deed is the written instrument. It has to have deed formalities with the two subscribing witnesses. The title is that position of ownership and you could have the action, the quiet title or the color of title. Those are some concepts. Estates and property interests, knowing about fee simple, life estate, remainder men, and just kind of conveyances and property. Joint tenancy, JTROS versus TIC versus tenancy by the entirety. Make sure you understand who will take when there's um, a death of some sort. Um, covenants and equitable servitudes, they're just restrictions on lands or affirmative duties on that come with land. And it's all about intent and notice and running with the land and equitable servitudes being remedied by equitable relief. Landlords and tenants, they're pretty obvious duties. We've all been landlords, we've all been tenants. You want to know the duties to each other. Just, I would, I would ask that you memorize um, periods. <laughs> what is it? Your period will suffer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, your period will suffer. Years, periodic tendencies, period uh, tendency at will and tendency at sufferance, and try to memorize the dates necessary for um, uh, termination. And, and just go through landlord tenant essays. We'll go through these together. Easements and adverse possession. Those should be common, simple subjects that you should anticipate on your uh, real property essays. Homestead exemption, and then the big thing I took out of miscellaneous slide was that Florida is a lean theory state and that Florida is a pure notice jurisdiction. That's like a good, you know, background into real property. When we come back from the break, we'll go through the outlines and make sure we touch on those details. But I just want to get everyone's wheels turning a little bit about what we think about with real property and what the essay is going to look like. It's usually going to involve multiple parties, conveyances, um, encumbrances, mortgages, documents that were, weren't signed properly, different types of deeds, bad landlords, bad tenants, you know, people who build waste on property. It's just gonna involve a whole bunch of messes related to property and really require you to know your stuff about what the issues are and what rights people have in the property. It's by no means easy, but I hope, uh, this first part of class was valuable and we took something out of it.